Today we're going to take a break from YouTube and set our sights on Twitter.com. The website everyone seems to know about, but no one really uses. And who can really blame them? It's not a place for normal people. You see, normal people are content with broadcasting their opinions to their local community of friends and family. On Twitter, you believe your opinions are important enough to share with the whole world. Of course, it's no surprise that this premise attracts a special kind of person. You almost have to have some sort of mental disorder to even tolerate this place. Narcissism, sociopathy, downward spiral, paranoia. Twitter is basically just a giant mental institution preventing these people from infesting the rest of the web. Twitter's user base is that dude you knew in high school who would smugly correct you about everything. Smug is actually one of the only three emotions you're allowed to feel on Twitter. The others being passive aggressive and It's an environment where you can slip up just once, even in an honest mistake from years ago, and you'll get tarred and feathered by a mob of anime profile pics, then beheaded by K-pop stands and taxidermized by militant political activists. If Instagram is the blissful blue pill of ignorance, Twitter is like sticking a razor blade up your sinuses. Twitter is what would happen if you took YouTube's comment section and made that the entire website. I apologize for the long-winded diatribe, but I really have to hammer in the point of how little value Twitter has to its users. On Twitter, you have nothing to gain, but everything to lose. YouTubers get ad revenue, Instagram models can work their way up to make sponsored posts. Even on Reddit, you can at least get gold by being the biggest suck-up imaginable. There is no monetary incentive to use Twitter. By the time you get big enough to make sponsored tweets, you're almost certainly at a status where you can make money in spite of yourself. If you're beneath this level, then good luck getting anything out of Twitter. Well, that's not exactly true. There are at least a few things you can get from Twitter. You can get canceled. You can get suspended for no reason. Realistically, the only redeeming quality of Twitter is networking as a content creator. But if you're just a regular user, I have no idea how you tolerate this place. Except, there is one other incentive to use Twitter. With no money to be made, the theoretical endgame of Twitter is to get one of these. Twitter's Verification Badge. The lone token of achievement in a cesspool of sin and misery. So how do you get it? Well, step one, be a reporter, corporation, or elite public figure. If you're not any of these things, then just give up. One day I got this joking reply to one of my tweets, but it raises a very valid question. Why is it so much harder to get verified on Twitter than anywhere else? Grande, 1.2 million Twitter followers, not verified. Critical, 5 million YouTube subscribers, nearly a million Twitch followers, not verified. Call me Carson, over a million Twitter followers. All of his posts get over 50,000 likes. He trended on Twitter from people wishing him happy birthday. Not verified. You go to the official verification page on Twitter and it's been radio silent for the past two and a half years. They keep saying to check back later for the new and improved verification system, but later never comes. What's going on here? Pretty much every website has a verification system. YouTube, Instagram, Pornhub, Edmodo. Once you accumulate a high enough status, something has to prevent people from just impersonating you and damaging your reputation. This is the theoretical purpose of a verification system on any website, and almost all websites have no issues whatsoever implementing this system in practice. Last year, my friend Rusty Cage got verified on Instagram while simultaneously being suspended multiple times without any chance for appeal on Twitter. It really just goes to show how differently Twitter treats its users than any other site. For some reason, Twitter has taken this simple concept and corrupted it into a confusing and unrecognizable mess. How did this happen? And what steps can you take to actually get verified on this website? Well, using some of the Twitter connections I've made over the years, I'm going to try my best to answer this question. First, how did we get here? And how has Twitter's verification system changed over time? 
Back in 2009, Twitter was becoming a big player in the world of social media on the World Wide Web, with celebrities from across the world flocking to the site to share their lives in 140 characters. The problem was, some of these accounts claiming to be people of note weren't who they said they were, rather just imposters. When St. Louis Cardinals manager Tony La Russa found out someone was impersonating him on the site, he went on to sue Twitter for damages. Not wanting this to happen, and again, the fine people at the internet startup devised a verification system that would allow famous users to protect their identity from being stolen by those with nefarious motives. In the early days, this was made specifically for celebrities, musicians, athletes, and other public figures. And a year or so later, brands and companies would be added to that list. The process to get a blue check mark seemed to be on a need-to-know basis. If you were popular enough to need one, you'd know how to get it. The at verified account is the public's best glimpse into the system at play, as it follows every single person that has been given verified status. Between 2009 and 2016, the site verified on average 25,000 accounts per year, totaling 186,000 out of 300 million. Some of these seem more justifiable than others. In the summer of 2016, Twitter released a public application for verification. This event coincided with the last generation of YouTubers to get verified, a generation considered by some Twitter users to have set our culture back by a decade. Sometimes I wish I could go back a decade to a time when Twitter would actually verify YouTubers, but I guess the next best thing is just asking these guys what the process was like. Now I don't have contact with Joji or iDubs, and Chad isn't verified, so that just leaves Max Mofo as my only option. Let's see what he had to say. Max told me that he didn't quite remember the specific process, but he thinks it probably happened as soon as the public application became available. The web archive shows that Max was verified as of September 2016, so this timing appears to check out. What matters here is that the verification process back then was free and easy, and the bar for entry was relatively low. Twitter's verification system was more equitable than ever before, but it would not last long. The time has come. Execute Order 66. On November 9th, 2017, Twitter announced that they were indefinitely suspending the verification process across the entire site. They would go on to strip verification from numerous controversial accounts, most notably de-verifying prominent white nationalist Richard Spencer. While many celebrated the announcement as a justified punishment, it didn't really make any sense administratively. Twitter's reasoning for de-verifying accounts was that an unnamed minority of users began to view the blue checkmark as an endorsement. Prior to the change, I found very little evidence of anyone publicly complaining about this, as the nature of verification should be obvious. It's a simple demarcation of a public figure. If Kim Jong-un were on Twitter, should he be verified? What about Pablo Escobar or Ted Bundy? Surely no one at Twitter would endorse any of their actions. But as such highly publicized individuals, it would be bizarre to imagine that these people wouldn't be verified on any public forum. The idea that verifications equal endorsements is incredibly flimsy. These two concepts are completely unrelated, yet Twitter chose to conflate them based on an unknown number of unspecified users getting confused. But let's get more confusing. Just one year earlier in 2016, Twitter suspended Richard Spencer and then reinstated him with his verification, upholding that verification does not equal endorsement. Today, when you look at Twitter's official verification page, it specifically states that verification does not equal endorsement. And there's an important reason behind this. Recently, President Trump threatened executive action against Twitter that would remove one of its safe harbor provisions. I've talked about a type of safe harbor before as it pertains to copyright law, and a similar provision exists in Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which protects sites like Twitter from being held liable for the conduct of their users. What's important here is that the exemption only exists if Twitter does not act as a publisher. By treating verification as an endorsement, Twitter could potentially jeopardize their safe harbor protection by assuming responsibility over user conduct. By choosing to curate verification along their own subjective standards, Twitter could have been classified as a publisher of any content posted by verified accounts, opening themselves up to potentially devastating liabilities. Now, I'm in no way a legal expert, so I could be completely wrong here, 
But this is just my best explanation for why Twitter has been so inconsistent with this issue. So far, it seems that this whole campaign was just a bunch of lip service. After 2017, they have made no major effort to de-verify controversial accounts. So was this whole exercise just completely pointless? For users, yes, but for Twitter, possibly not. While Richard Spencer drew in all the attention from the incident, nobody realized that this event would mark the end of equitable verification on Twitter entirely. Not only that, but every existing support article about verification was subsequently removed. Links to these old articles now all redirect to a generic page with barely any information. To this day, public verification on Twitter remains indefinitely suspended. So what led Twitter to quietly make such a drastic change? To find out why, we have to follow the money. In 2015, Twitter's active user base plateaued. The site was no longer growing. Just one year afterwards, Twitter's stock price had fallen by 70%. The company's then-CEO Dick Costello was pressured to step down and was replaced by current Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey. For most of 2017, the stock price remained stagnant while the rest of the market surged. Twitter was in bad shape and investors were rapidly losing confidence. Numerous financial publications listed Jack Dorsey among the worst CEOs in America. Starting November 9th, Twitter suspended verification and then went on to post its first profitable quarter in company history. 2018 saw Twitter's revenue increase by nearly 25%, causing the stock price to effectively double. It was at this point that the worthless blue checkmark became a commodity. But how do you convert a blue badge into green paper? To find out, we have to cross over to the corporate side of Twitter. Ah, brand Twitter. There's nothing else really like it. Long ago, pretty much every brand account on Twitter only existed to spam hashtags and submissively apologize to disgruntled customers. Then, everything changed when Wendy's attacked. All of a sudden, every brand you can imagine was jockeying to see who can make the most viral tweet. This quickly escalated to empathetic moon pie consoling depressed Sunny D. You're looking at the future of marketing here, people. Basically, every brand who was any brand had to develop a sassy or relatable persona and playfully banter with each other on Twitter. It's so convincing. They act just like people. They show emotions just like people. But don't be fooled. Much like in general society, these brands are among the most powerful members of Twitter. And there's a good reason for that. As much as Twitter's leadership would like you to forget, Twitter is a for-profit business first and a public forum second. Like many sites, Twitter earns its revenue from advertising. Brands provide the funding that Twitter needs to survive as a business, so it should be no surprise why brands tend to receive the most preferential treatment. Brand accounts have the easiest path to verification. It's surprising to find one without a check mark. You'd think they get it automatically, but it's actually not that simple. While researching this video, I actually had to enter forbidden territory by consulting the wisdom of a real-life brand. Thankfully, Stakeum had followed me some time ago, so I reached out to them for comment. What they told me may shock you. It turns out that after Twitter suspended verification, the change was severe enough to affect some brands. Stakeum actually had to create their own guerrilla campaign in order to draw the attention of the right people. According to them, Twitter prioritizes verifying companies that spend the most advertising money on the site. This key piece of information may explain why Twitter verification has seemed so inaccessible over the past few years. The checkmark itself doesn't generate revenue, but it rewards companies who do. Keeping the checkmark accessible would devalue its purpose as an incentive for ad spending. This could also explain why so many accounts in the news industry are verified. News media is one of the only industries to heavily rely on Twitter as part of the rat race to get clicks. There's no doubt that news articles play a heavy role in Twitter's information economy. Featured articles will drive the most traffic to their native sites. And one has to wonder how much some of these media outlets spend to put themselves in that position. Now, I'm not saying that the checkmark is the sole reason for Twitter's boom in revenue, but it's almost certainly symptomatic of the site's more brand-happy business model as of late. And based on its success so far, verification may never return to how it once was. Welcome to the age of the blue filter, where independent creators without industry backing may be stuck without a checkmark forever. 
In this age, only a few creators have managed to buck the trend and get verified, so I reached out to as many as I could and asked them how they did it. Kavos is a YouTuber you wouldn't expect to be verified on Twitter given the far more massive channels who still remain unverified. So I asked him how he did it and this is what he had to say. Kavos is part of the YouTube network BBTV. Sometime in 2019, he put in a request to the network to get him verified on Twitter. Three months later, the network succeeded. So it appears that joining a YouTube network could help you get verified. However, most YouTubers would generally not recommend joining a YouTube network given how many of them take a decent cut of your pay to do basically nothing. Occasionally, you'll get the rare goodie like the coveted blue check mark, but other than that, networks tend to carry a great risk for creators with little benefit. If you have to resort to a management company, you may just want to pump and dump them like too mad. You know the vibes? Bro, well, literally I signed with some management company and um, they submitted me to some guy, this guy named Zach Mazota. This guy is the guy who verifies people, a lot of gaming guys. And I mean, I had no idea it was coming. He just let me know, like, at one point, like, yo, I also submit you for verification. I was like, oh, wait, really? Yeah, they replied. They said, yeah, it should be done. I was like, wait, what? Really? Oh, okay. So then, after a little while, it happened. I just got verified. Earlier this year, Alpharad successfully became one of the only accounts in history to get verified with an anime profile picture. I saw some rumors that he may have encouraged his fans to impersonate him so he could force Twitter to verify him. This same impersonation exploit is suggested in a video by Tech Boomers, but doesn't appear to have worked on their own account. Starting a mass impersonation campaign seems like a one-way ticket to getting banned, so I asked Alpharad if these rumors were true. It turns out he actually got verified with help from esports organization Panda Global. This explains how so many esports competitors seem to get verified so easily. Unlike a YouTube network, esports organizations pay you to help manage your profile. But also unlike a YouTube network, you can't just sign up for FaZe Clan or Team Liquid. These organizations only tend to sponsor the most elite esports players, not exactly a practical option for content creators just looking to get verified on Twitter. If you're looking for the most direct path to verification, you may have to follow in the footsteps of Cowbelly Studios. Recently, he shared this post detailing the process of how he got verified, so I asked him to elaborate on how the system works. Basically, he hired a specialized service to have Twitter review his account for verification. The service ran through a site called FamousInfluencer.com, and as part of the process, they groomed his profile for success giving him the criteria that Twitter currently requires for verification. Some of the requirements are just cosmetic, such as displaying your real name and face on your profile. Personally, I found this somewhat counterintuitive as your followers should be used to your specific branding and persona, and disrupting that is definitely going to hurt your engagement. I mean, should we expect rappers to display their real names before verifying their profiles? It seems kind of dumb to me. This place isn't exactly LinkedIn. Here's the real kicker though. The most important factor in Twitter's new standards for verification is whether or not you've been featured in mainstream news articles. Now, personally, I've actually been cited and interviewed for quite a few online articles. One time I even made the cover of Meme Insider, so where's my badge? Well, showing up in articles only takes you so far. To actually get verified, you need to initiate a manual review by a contact at Twitter. Contact? What are you talking about? The enigmatic Twitter contact is the final boss of verification. They are people speculated to work within Twitter's communications department who serve as the ultimate gatekeepers of the blue check mark. You could meet all the criteria for verification, but without access to a contact, the blue check mark will forever remain out of reach. This is why someone like Nerd City, who has been featured in dozens of articles, still remains unverified. And as it turns out, the lion's share of Twitter contacts are held by big companies, political institutions, and news publications. If multi-million dollar brands like Stakeum have trouble getting in touch with one, then what chance do independent creators have? PR agencies like Famous Influencer will sell you the opportunity to reach a contact for the low, low price of 5,000 pounds. And that's if you already have the mainstream news coverage. 
famous influencer also has a network of mainstream press writers at their disposal to totally manufacture you into a media darling. Of course, at the additional cost of thousands more. Over just a few years, Twitter has managed to take a free feature and stick it behind what is essentially a paywall of thousands of dollars. And they have deliberately tried to restrict access to any information about how the verification process even works. Twitter now resembles a pay to win game. And I'm not really sure I want to play anymore. This site has become a permanent reminder to me that as bad as YouTube's leadership is, it can still get worse. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey always boasts about wanting to promote healthy conversation, usually while introducing features that literally restrict conversation. Our platform promotes speech unless people violate our rules. You listen to Twitter's officials talk about this site like they're building some sort of utopia of erudite public discourse. Have you seen the people on this site? It's not a vocal minority. Go click on any trend on the Discover page and you'll see enraged psychopaths viciously attacking each other like someone kicked over a hornet's nest. It's a site where otherwise calm people go to have an emotional meltdown. Basically, if you're looking for healthy discussion, you've come to the wrong place. Well, you think this is going to cause a little more anger? The world is an angry place. But you know what certainly doesn't help the harmonious temperament of this site? Creating an arbitrary system to segregate the protected elites from the worthless plebs. Twitter has corrupted the verification system to such an extent where lots of people seem to have more respect for non-verified people than verified people. The phrase blue checkmark has quite literally become a pejorative term against obnoxious verified accounts. But it's hard to blame the blue checkmarks for acting like any other user. A few months ago, Critical made a point about Twitch's inconsistent enforcement of their community guidelines, specifically how certain female streamers seem immune from punishment. That's pretty much like the Twitch mod team here, just operating in secrecy, which is the worst way of doing things. With no transparency, it just leads to a lot of confusion and a lot of bad things, even for the streamers that they seem to want to protect. And I don't even know if that's the right word for it. I don't even know if they're making a conscious decision to protect streamers, but just this weird favoritism they seem to play in this bias leads to these conspiracy theories where, you know, all women are invincible on Twitch because they're giving nude photos to the mod team for special treatment. He said that by arbitrarily protecting female streamers, Twitch encourages its community to unfairly target and resent them. Similarly, I feel that Twitter's inconsistent verification system has caused people to distrust verified accounts. I have no doubt in my mind that the commodification of the blue checkmark has contributed to the public's growing resentment of journalists. People new to the site have to wonder why a random reporter with 5,000 followers is verified but their favorite YouTuber with 500,000 followers isn't. This distinction can only create suspicion and discontent, and it makes the site look incredibly out of touch with its users. Perhaps the gatekeeping wouldn't be as much of an issue if Twitter actually applied consistently strict standards to everyone. But when journalists get to act as unprofessionally as anyone else while flexing their I'm better than you badge, the whole thing reeks of systematic favoritism. Oh my gosh, is that an article? Oh, you're a journalist! That's so great! Here, why don't you take about 10 of these? Give them to all your friends. People may bash the blue check marks, but Twitter itself is to blame for administering such a skewed system. At least YouTube, despite all of its problems, has managed to create and maintain an equitable verification system. There is no such stigma around gray check marks on YouTube. But still, in classic YouTube fashion, they had to at least try and ruin it. Remember last year when, for absolutely no reason, YouTube tried to overhaul the verification system in a thinly veiled attempt to elevate corporate accounts? Remember how universally unpopular it was? And how everyone flipped out to such an extent that YouTube backed out after 24 hours and never brought it up again? Well, guess what, fellas? That garbage system proposed by YouTube is how Twitter's verification system works right now. And unlike YouTube, Twitter shows no signs of remorse about it. They openly mock how they deliberately neglect their users. It's all just a big joke to them. You know, maybe more people would actually use this site if the management didn't treat the average user with utter contempt. And it's not just the verification system that reflects this. Recently, Twitter user Lamus Chris documented compelling evidence of a belligerent account abusing an insider connection at Twitter support to ban innocent users without any recourse for appeal. 
This is in addition to a never-ending string of DMCA takedowns in which Twitter allows trolls to submit unlimited false copyright claims with no proof whatsoever. This is a site where you can literally post gore and pornography, but God forbid you depict cheese at hitting the World Trade Center. Our platform promotes speech unless people violate our rules. Twitter wants to be seen as a utopia, so why does using this site feel like I'm in Soviet Russia? The site is in general disrepair, people constantly disappear without warning, and the corrupt, delusional leadership would rather focus on a petty pissing contest with America's president than actually responding to the needs of its users. I'm sorry, but when Steak Um is a better source of information than your own help page, then maybe your site has a bit of a transparency issue. How does one acquire the illustrious checkmark on Twitter? There's a guy named Kayvon. He's the verification god, so just go to him and he'll get you sorted. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Actually, as I was making this video, it's been rumored that Twitter has plans to finally roll out a new public application for verification. I guess it took them two and a half years to fix something that wasn't even broken in the first place. Who knows, maybe we'll be able to trim videos again before the end of the century. It just goes to show that this site has so little to offer that they stroke themselves off for adding features that already existed, should have always existed, and only don't exist because of their own incompetence. I owe Twitter, can we get that edit button in 2020? The answer is no. So in conclusion, Twitter is a terrible platform run by terrible people where terrible users have terrible discussions about terrible issues. And for some reason, this site attracts a bunch of YouTubers. Can't imagine why, but at least it's good for networking. Because as YouTubers, we know that Twitter will hold off on verifying us for as long as they possibly can. Almost none of the information I learned in this video came from Twitter itself. It was only made possible through the assortment of connections I've made over the years. So despite being a general bane on society, Twitter's good for at least one thing. As for the blue check mark, I don't even really want it anymore. Several thousand dollars is a steep price to pay for something that should be free, and the whole machine around it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. For all intents and purposes, having the badge doesn't even do much. You get to more easily interact with other verified accounts, but that's about it. None of the people I interviewed saw a huge improvement in their quality of life after being verified, and it didn't seem to contribute to any direct financial benefit. Honestly, this whole video just made me sad, frustrated, and was overall just a big waste of time. So really no different than my experience browsing Twitter. I'm starting to see why PewDiePie left this place. At the end of the day, I guess the blue check mark wound up being the most appropriate symbol of Twitter as a whole. You have nothing to gain and everything to lose. Here you go! Wagon. Wagon. One bite?